morning, everybody. A perfect start. Curious faces in these fresh spaces. An influential Danish architect and designer always said and says, if you are in doubt, leave some meters out. With other words, appreciate, embrace density. Come closer. Let's get intimate. No one bites here unless you want us to. On a beautiful morning like this, we prefer a more close setting. So maybe you have difficulties to hear on the last uh, rows, if I speak. <laughs> <laughs> As a courtesy to my guest, to make him feel comfortable enough to share with you the most, I will keep the introduction in English. I do hope you agree and that you feel comfortable too, especially also to pose questions, no matter if in English, French, Italian, German. We will translate. So in the framework of this year's Design Days, we have the pleasure to welcome some of the most interesting and innovative personalities here with us. Hello, Simon Huslein, born in the German city of Werneck. Not really well known, but drawing lines on a map, it geographically defines more or less the precise center point of Germany. Simon studied industrial design at the Darmstadt University of Applied Sciences and completed his master's degree at the Royal College of Art in London. He has realized projects in Zurich, Tokyo, London, Shanghai and elsewhere and given lectures at various universities. During five years, Simon worked with his mentor and friend, one of the most important contemporaries with designers, Hannes Wittstein, in his Zurich studio. Between 2008, the year of the death of Hannes Wettstein, and 2014, Simon shaped the work of Studio Hannes Wettstein as creative director and member of the board. Simon now works independent and continues to develop products, furniture, installations, and spatial designs. He also does brand consultancy, and when time allows, he teaches. So we are very happy to have Simon here with us at the head. Add to that a portfolio of international collaborations and prizes, such as the Designer Saturday Silver Award for a Horgen Klarus installation, a special mention at the German Design Award in 2015, and the prestigious Red Dot Award. You now became also a jury member of Red Dot Award. In short, behind his modest appearance, I detect a strong, if not restless, personality where you can expect everything from delicate, refined, minimalistic watches to completely deconstructed furnitures and flying trees, as if gravity never existed. Simon seems to have developed a method which melts barriers between different genres, embraces multidisciplinary creativity, oscillating effortless, between projects ranging from architecture, scenography, installations, to industrial product, furniture, and corporate design. You worked with Ala Pedonpracht, Casina, Glashütte, Braun, Ventura, to name a few. You just founded your own watch company together with partner Pia Nobs. What is, I hope you will dive into that later on, the driving force, the trigger, that you don't want to fix yourself to a specific field? Cross-disciplinarity, team spirit, precision, a passion for the limitation in materials and their possibility, especially unseen ones, an intuitive and experimental approach, and the creation of emotions are some of the keywords which come to mind. We learned from Peter Ippolito, another great figure in design, whom we had here with us during a talking head, that he originally wanted to become the Chancellor of Germany. Simon, though, is a little bit more modest. In his early days, he wanted to become a priest or a pastor, if I'm right. The black clothes I already can imagine, but obviously the Sunday morning thing wasn't your thing. Then on the other hand, you also have a past as a hip-hop DJ and producer. Simon also has a reputation to shake and rumble boring parties and festivities by the means of design with the help of just a package of aluminum foil. 
We check that one out. Next time, the head is throwing a big event. You also dispose over, at least in our Swiss context, a slightly anarchistic ritual, which you share every Friday morning, 6 o'clock, with a bunch of friends. Let's say, an unusual way of exploring the city. You are doing parkour. Persons close to you, personally or professionally, say you have a distinct pronounced need for harmony. Open confrontation isn't Simon's thing. So how do you deal with clients in difficult situations? Discipline is very important to you, obviously. Also the discipline to strictly distinguish and separate between work and family. I had the pleasure to visit Simon's home once, which is a refreshingly design-free zone. You seem to approach every new ask, task, client, situation with a mix of open mind, non-categorizing look, a childlike curiosity, a zen-like reflection and meditative aura. It's almost like if I feel stressed, I want to share a few moments beside Simon to calm down. Simon stretches and pushes the limits constantly further of what seemed to be technically possible or perceptually and conceptually imaginable. The word innovation has been used too much, nearly inflationary when it comes to new interiors. Also, if it sometimes just was about the same thing again, just in another color, surface, material. We see an accelerating trend of brands which produce certain emotions, a certain image, which in the end can tend to be a clean, sterile image. Design is here nothing more than an added value. And as an added thing, following a quick trend, it quickly loses its interesting aspect. In the case of Simon's work, there is no sterility, but an idea and utmost tangibility in the foreground. You want to touch his works and not just see them. To me, his works appear refreshingly innovative. It reflects in a very illustrative way the rich variety of scales, approaches, thoughts and methodologies of good design and the good part of the challenges a designer can address himself to, not only reactive to needs and tasks given, but proactive with the braveness to leave the comfort zone and the beaten path, equipped with the pioneering spirit of a researcher. That's why we are very happy to have you here today, Simon. I start with one question to bring you on, on let's say, the good mood. Uh, close to you, the charismatic Polish pianist Christian Zimmermann lives in Basel, teaches there, talks about music, and the idea of creating music. He puts it simple. He said, music is not sound. Music is organizing people's emotions in time. If we take his pomo, what is designed to you? Well, first of all, thank you so much for this uh, spectacular announcement. I hope the projects and the conversation will uh, keep up with that. Um, as I will show later on, um, emotion is a very essential part of what I'm trying to create, especially with uh, spatial uh, installations. And um, from my point of view, uh, the opportunity we have with emotions is unbelievable. If we manage, especially as creatives, to um, create an emotion in the way that we want to, uh, we'll have a very, very um, long-lasting memory in the people that we're going to touch with our work. Meaning, um, there is this quote, people don't remember what you said, but they will never forget how you made them feel. So the strength of creating emotions, whether we are spatial designers or creatives in any kind, um, the opportunity is really strong to have um, a sustainable memory uh, with the people that are going to consume our work in whatever way that might be. Mm -hmm. Can you illustrate that with a few of your Yeah, projects? I'll show uh, some work and I'll try to, 
to make that connection in in the in the presentation. Let's go. Okay. <laughs> So again, uh, thank you for having me here today. Uh, I'm very pleased to be one of the first speakers in the new auditorium. And um, very much looking forward to start uh, teaching here, uh, as I yeah, just did two weeks ago. Um, the presentation I have to today, I want to start with um, a project I did uh, just two years uh, ago. It was called Seeing Simon, and it was installed in a gallery in Zurich. And as you might see very, very uh, uh, inside the dark, this was the image I took for the, for the flyer, for the presentation of the project, or the introduction. And it was installed in, a, in the gallery in the street. And as you can see, uh, I also used uh, the image as a, a huge print in the window of the, of the gallery. Very hard to see, but that was the kind of intention that just came out of the, of the darkness. So what I did, um, I set up um, this installation that I announced as a scenographical journey or, or a trip that people could book, and they had to go on Doodle and um, find a time that they could come to, to the exhibition. And once they locked in their name, uh, this time uh, slot was then blocked, meaning um, I could make sure that each individual was in the exhibition on themselves. There was no other people at the same time. Um, the installation in began, began in complete darkness, which is really difficult to show you on a screen. I would have to to crawl inside, um, but I'll show some images uh, of the content. And what happened is you really were alone in complete darkness. And I started with a narrative of texts that uh, kind of made a range from uh, texts that I selected, like quotes from other people, all the way to something very, very personal. Um, so what I wanted to do is um, people kind of follow me on, on, a, on a trace of what my mind uh, had to express. So this was the very first text that you would find in the darkness, um, which kind of gave the overall um, idea of the exhibition that it was about um, showing yourself. So in my case, the exhibition was called Seeing Simon. I really tried to connect to my audience in the most uh, active way. Um, the reason I did this exhibition, I was, uh, I just left uh, the studio Hannes Wettstein and I really had to explore where I was going. And I used scenography, I used this exhibition as one of the main uh, pushes for myself into my, my future, let's say. So you then walked through, through this darkness to the next text and I'll sh just show you a few of them. Um, again, this was really the initiation. The first text I show is more like a rational beginning, and it got more close and more personal the longer uh, you would walk through it. Um, so these were texts I selected over the years from, from books I was reading or, or websites I found, and they really meant something for me. So I really tried to uh, have this kind of journey be very, very close to, to me. I showed uh, who were my teachers in the past. I showed who were my uh, triggers and the context I, I'm working in. So the closer you would get, um, the more I really focused on myself. And this is kind of like a description of how I int interpreted myself as what I was doing. And one of the final uh, information was about the, the, the so-called talents that were uh, given me by the Clifton Strength Finder. It's a website which I recommend to each of you to uh, go through the whole process of typing in um, your strengths and weaknesses and 
it will give you five um, points uh, of a huge database that this uh, software thinks that your strengths are. It's really interesting. <coughs> so um, the reason I did this exhibition, I said before, I really wanted to find um, the next level of how and where and with whom I was to work. So this is uh, two and a half years ago. Um, and I communicated that. I was honest enough to really say I'm at that level in my life where I'm trying to find out where it's going. Um, after going through this dark um, kind of spiral uh, space, you had to climb a ladder into a higher uh, area and you stick your head out and then you're surrounded by uh, tiny uh, fireflies, let's say. And what I did, I, I had this um, little uh, a fan that you have in computers, um, and I attached uh, an, a little light. And then what happens is through the, um, through the uh, air motion, the thing starts kind of making a really analog, very somehow beautiful path, very individual. So all of those um, 60 uh, fans that I installed in the end, or 66, they were doing this kind of weird movement and sticking your head out in the gallery about three and a half meters high above the ground. You're just surrounded by all those fireflies. It was a very poetic moment. Um, and it kind of summed up this very rational trace that you had to come to this position. <clears throat> so this was purely emotional and I, it kind of ended the journey that I've been giving before. So what happened after that? Um, I founded uh, my own atelier, um, and this exhibition kind of gave me the confidence and also the basic connections for my, my first projects that I did uh, being independent. So I'll show three projects that I did um, in the beginning. Um, this is an exhibition in the Museum Strauhof in Zurich. It's uh, connected to the literature uh, research department. And they um, gave me the opportunity to really express um, the content of this great writer um, with my own um, methods. So again, I was building something very dark. People would approach the um, the lifetime story of this writer in this very closed and, and kind of uh, very uh, personal space. And it was uh, perceived as being really uh, touching people as they were walking through the exhibition. Um, there was another space where you could uh, watch uh, films of experts that would explain uh, their beliefs and their thoughts about the writer and you kind of had to walk through this, uh, through this uh, installation of, of wooden um, elements that were a narrative out of a drawing that uh, Friedrich Klauser had done. So it just really tried to give the audience a reason to stay in the exhibition, not just run through to really kind of uh, yeah, be inside and, and become part of, of the movement of the exhibition. Um, another project I did um, at the Designer Saturday, some of you have been visiting, um, was for the company Stornbracht and Alape. They work in the kitchen and household field. Dornbracht is doing um, t uh, the the water outlets of all kinds, and Alape does uh, the basins for it. And I tried to, what I was asked to do is an installation that would kind of accumulate what both brands do and what they are about. And obviously water is the essential uh, element that uh, has like run through both of, of the objects. But for me, it was more interesting to see where else this could be, and I, I explored the, the idea of 
using soap, using cleaning ritual with this, uh, with this installation. And I ended up um, setting up these uh, 15 pots where there was uh, foam uh, being built inside, kind of grown, and then like uh, lifting up to the sky. It was not uh, generated with air, but with helium, like a gas that would kind of start flying. I'll show a little video where you can see it. So the, before you would enter the uh, installation, there was this projection of the creation of the foam in like a huge, uh, a huge bubble on the on the floor, and people had to has, had to pass that um, projection to get inside the the installation. And as you can see, it was really dark again. It's really a, a theme that I, that I uh, continue exploring. Um, and you can see now one of the, of the pots, they're like this size. Inside there is, um, like, uh, the walls are covered with moss, like with the green uh, stuff from the forest. And then within each of those, you have these bubbles emerge. And then we developed an air um, outlet that would kind of blow air underneath so the thing would just lift off. So it was really, uh, for me, amazing to just observe people just stopping there and just being so excited about exploring what was happening in there. Um, so the simplicity of the idea and the effect uh, together really created this emotion that I, that I was imagining to be, to be happening. <clears throat> um, so when I did the exhibition, I was writing this uh, sentence as well that I was looking for someone to work with me. And through the exhibition I did, through the Seeing Simon installation, I got in contact with um, an entrepreneur um, that asked me to join him on the development of a new furniture brand. He had just acquired a company in Germany um, that was uh, one of the oldest manufacturers of uh, upholstered wooden chairs. And for yeah, almost uh, two years now, we're working on the development of a range of uh, furniture pieces, which I'm not allowed to reveal yet. But anyhow, uh, I'll just quickly show you a few uh, images of what we're doing and how I'm working uh, within the furniture field. Um, from the development of the, of the 3D design, we then uh, work with the workshop to de define the, um, uh, the prototype uh, arrangement. And once we're happy with the, the overall uh, elements, we scan those objects with very high resolution scanners. So you really get an image of the the bone structure, the wooden structure that's inside the furniture, because once it's upholstered, you, you cannot access it anymore. So what happens with this uh, camera, you get this like high-res uh, 3D file, which is like a tenth of a millimeter precision um, of, the, of the wood. And then um, later on, when you 
uh, have the upholstered chair and you decide, okay, now we have, we changed some dimensions, you, ha you can then use uh, a process called reverse engineering, meaning when you do the, the CAD drawing, you really know exactly where you want each element to be, because you have the foundation of the scan underneath your drawings. So um, with that, we're in the process of realizing those, uh, those uh, furniture pieces that will reveal, be revealed within um, the beginning of next year. So again, for me, this was really um, something uh, amazing that with, with this exhibition, with the opportunity of having this audience visit, uh, my thoughts and, and uh, my, my situation, I really could connect to one of, of the audience um, to really start this journey together that I was looking for. Another project that uh, happened not through the exhibition but through an existing contact to Pianops, he is an entrepreneur as well, uh, had uh, been running a successful watch brand in the past and is now kind of retired, but not. He called me up early this year and he said, um, we have to get together, I have an idea. And what he came up with was an idea how we could um, define a new genre of watch that would overpass the problems with the new Swiss made regulations. Uh, since the beginning of this year, if you uh, sell a watch that um, says it's Swiss made, you have to do a lot of your work within Switzerland, which totally makes sense. But for small watch brands, it's really difficult. Um, they either have to charge very high sums to their product, or they uh, cannot say it's Swiss made anymore because they have to uh, move production to Asia. Um, so the idea behind this product, which we call Bolido, is a Spanish word for meteor. Um, the idea behind it was to um, design it in a way where it didn't need um, a molding process to be produced. So if you have a mold, which is very expensive, costs about uh, 20 to 30,000 Swiss francs, just the mold. You have to then uh, work around the thing that comes out and polish it and do all kinds of extra work. It makes a small, a small limit, uh, like a limited number of products very, very expensive. Only works if you do really hundreds of thousands. Um, so, just a second. So the design um, was done in a way where we used as little as possible amount of components and I made sure that the, um, the main body was being able to be produced on automated lathing machines, which is a process that uh, is very established in Switzerland. This is an early uh, rapid prototyping uh, volume model and a later uh, volume model of the metal. But the interesting part is how it's being produced. So it's not molded. It is um, made by a lathing machine. So this machine is automatic and you, it just pushes the metal from the back and then takes off all the elements from the front uh, by itself and then cuts it off and you almost get the final result out of the machine. There is no handmade uh, process involved. And this uh, industry is highly uh, developed in Switzerland. They work for uh, German car brands and whatsoever to produce parts. So we could use an existing industry in the country um, to produce uh, parts of our watch. And with that, we were able to, um, to price our product comparatively low, um, which is very attractive uh, for the audience that we're looking. So this is me together with Pierre in the beginning of the project. And if you're interested, I can show you um, the product later. So in order to being able to do this project, um, we used uh, a now very uh, accessible financing principle called uh, crowdfunding. 
uh, on the platform called Kickstarter. And uh, we were happy enough to, to be founded for the money we needed to, to lift off our project just within hours. So after 16 hours, we had the acquired uh, 58,000 Swiss francs that we wanted just by people that ordered uh, watches before the brand even existed. So this is a very ex uh, successful example of how much the power now moves to those who use it. It's really uh, unbelievable. Uh, it was the first time for me to do something like this, and it was a lot of work to setting it up, doing all the, the video to show, hey, we're doing this project, help us. But in the end, it was really a great experience how much this is possible to, to use your own creativity to do something in real life. So this is one of the shots of the prototypes that we did. And now uh, next week, we'll send out the first batch of 80 watches. And the rest is being produced at the moment. Um, so. Prior um, my independent work, uh, as Jan was uh, saying before, I was working for Hannes Wettstein, a very influential and, and uh, famous uh, figure in design and interior architecture in Switzerland. He passed away 2008, and um, I was fortunate enough to um, being able to work with him for many, many years. And he kind of took me on as a, a very close person to really show me how he was working, giving me a lot of trust into how I was supporting his work. Um, so this was uh, really the initiation of a lot of things that now matter to me. <clears throat> um, we did a book 2011 about his work and an exhibition in the ETH, the school in Zurich. Um, where we used the main auditory, uh, the main uh, hall of the building to show uh, most of his important uh, projects. And we also did uh, a projection on the back of the, of the exhibition where we um, had this nice animation of all his sketches. He was sketching like crazy. And we had all the scans of, of those uh, images he did and they were kind of falling into the exhibition, kind of like a really soft, uh, soft way to, to show uh, those imaginations he had. <clears throat> so when I um, started working again in the company after he passed away, um, I was fortunate enough to being involved in a lot of different projects. We were uh, like a team of different people and I, uh, as a creative director, was able to influence a lot of those projects, um, which I'm showing you. Some of them, the range was from TV studios to uh, furniture products of all kinds. There were... Um, Watches, of course, which we could continue the work of Hannes Wettstein for several brands or even establish new ones. Um, this is uh, an installation for a parquet manufacturer that was not just about showing the product in a nice way, but also showing it in different light situations. So the, the light was changing in a way like the sunlight would change during the day, getting a warmer and a colder aspect of the light. So you could see the parquet in the way that the reality would show it. More furniture, uh, especially for the Swiss brand Horgen Glarus. And there were spatial installations. And I'll focus on this more because it now uh, is more of a continuation for me than other projects that I did at uh, Studio Hannes Wettstein. This was uh, also a Designer Saturday installation we did for a Swiss company called Skyframe. They do these moving windows, and what those windows do, um, they kind of disappear. 
meaning you have your room with the window that's from the ceiling to the floor, from left to right, it's inexistent. Either it's closed, so there's just glass, or it's open to the side, so there is nothing between the inside and the outside. And how you would um, present this product to the audience was kind of, kind of tricky. And what we did, we installed the window between an inside and an outside to have this kind of membrane that would give the visitors of Designer Saturday this kind of, ah, now I'm entering the outside, this kind of feeling. Um, and to have the outside be felt as, okay, now we're outside, uh, even we're in the exhibition hall, um, there was this analogy of the full moon in the back, and again I used this little um, fan activated lights that would fly around uh, and people had to kind of navigate through them to get to the exit of the exhibition. Um, so this project was really about the imagination of, you know, what could we do with space to support um, the idea of what the products and the brand was about. But there was other projects where we had a more clear starting point. For instance, um, we designed um, a family of chairs called Clio for Horgen Glarus, and the development of those chairs was mainly um, uh, related to the fact that we wanted to use the most um, massive piece of wooden board that the company was able to bend. So they do a lot of bending. They bend the legs of the chairs and all, all the backrest, really steam the wood, bend it, dry it, and then build their products with it. And this was kind of like the most massive piece their machines were able to, to push. And with this, we, the chair was supposed to be cut out of this um, massive piece. And um, because we did already the chair, we were also imagining how could an exhibition that would present this chair be composed of? How could we use this uh, element to then include into our exhibition. So this is um, how they bend the wood. It comes out of an oven. You see the oven up there. It's in there for a couple of hours under pressure and with a lot of steam. And then this machine just pushes it together. You can really sense the force. And then it gets um, held in the position that it's now moved into a drying chamber and then after a couple of days, it remains in that position. It's unbelievable. Even you put it into w water or steam, it will never go back into the original uh, position after it's dried. It kind of changes the physical uh, structure of the wood. So, yeah, trying to find an emotional metaphor of what we could do with those elements, um, we uh, developed this kind of herd of cow-like or yeah, uh, animals that um, were composed very simply by those elements. And then our backrest of the chair would be kind of like the horns. And we had big ones, we had small ones, they would like move their head. And it was a really engaging installation where people had to walk through the through the animals to get through the exhibition and they would just push you know the things and watch it and laugh and it was really a, a nice way to engage so this is the installation when the light was still on and then later it was quite dark in there so it's kind of this mystical feeling walking through the animals and uh, before you enter the the exhibition 
there was um, roots of trees coming out of the ceiling to give you this basement. We're in the basement, we're underneath the earth. There is this place where these cows uh, are, and this, this, this kind of narrative of the space that worked really nicely. And then in the end, you would uh, proceed to the, to the furniture pieces that we didn't lacquer. We left them very um, original. The wood was still um, uh, yeah, untouched. And then later on, you would see the finally, like the painted thing that you could sit on. <coughs> So this was kind of the narrative coming from uh, the object to the installation. Um, and then there was kind of like a, a process the other way around. Uh, we did an installation for the company called Bauwerk Parkett. Um, and the first project we did with them was this huge pile of, of elements that uh, you were able to enter. And inside, um, we made the walls out of tiny parquet elements, so it's all made from these little parquet pieces. And we wanted to use um, the parquet as something that really uh, made the impact by itself. And with many ideas we tried, we came up with the idea to, to use this element. Like it's really, this is the stuff they glue on the floor, the way it is. And let's see. So it now makes sound. And it says, so klingt Eiche. This is how oak sounds like. And we installed uh, three of those on the ceiling of this it tower where they were rotating, so there was this sound immersion of in this, in this space. And when you left it, they gave you one of those as like kind of like a present. Um, so again, using the object as the central piece of a spatial immersive installation. Um, because we worked so close with the company, um, we were able to do more uh, installation. This was one where we built little houses and kind of throw them upside down. You could climb inside. And the reason for this was that you now can access, access the floor or the material that they sell um, without having to lie down or kind of cramp on the floor. It was really kind of in your face. You could touch it. You can see the quality of the product. So we kind of threw around the whole building um, to do this. And um, after a while, we decided um, that we would try to elaborate a new kind of parquet floor. And we co convinced uh, Bauwerk Parquet uh, to trust us to do this development together with them. And from many, many ideas that we had um, around the theme of pattern, like repetitive uh, new shapes of elements. Uh, you can see uh, we, we cut all kinds of dimensions and try to, to find uh, interesting new, uh, new solutions. We came up with a very simple but very powerful idea of just those two elements. So one is in the uh, ratio of one to two, and one is in the ratio of one to three. So what you can do with those is simply simple but very striking. You can do a range of patterns that are because of the quite uh, massive size of each element. Uh, you can do something very poetic in the room with the floor. So it can go from you know traditional patterns to something more uh, complicated. Um, and because of the size, it always looks quite generous. It looks quite lux luxurious. The older patterns that you see in, in castles and in all kinds of buildings, they're very small, and those are huge. So it really is a contemporary floor, even if it uses this um, traditional patterns, let's say. And what we figured out while we were uh, doing the first project, 
um, is that we can combine different patterns within one uh, apartment, let's say, or one building. So this is the first um, apartment, apartment that was built using this, uh, this new floor uh, system. And you can see the bedroom where you know, we wanted the atmosphere to be quiet and relaxed. We used the smaller one and just in a very simple way, just rep repeating it. And then as you would go into the alley that would connect the living room and the bedroom, the same patterns would kind of start moving. So they would kind of like shift back and forth. So it was a more dynamic expression of the exact same floor. There was no disconnection between the living, uh, the bedroom and the alley. It was just suddenly it would start to do this. And then when you would approach into the living room, which was massive, then you can see as the alley pattern changes into something even more wild and kind of, you know, more expressive if that's something you're interested in. So we had different patterns of that kind of uh, loudness um, and it was a really nice way to have all those different expressions with the same floor in the same apartment. <coughs> the last project I'm showing within the um, Studio Hannes Wettstein time uh, is this watch for Nomos that I did. Um, I've been working on different watches with them. And this one, um, I could really uh, put in a lot of ideas that I had gathered over the years into how um, the surface, how the elements of the watch could be designed. And it became a really kind of masterpiece of polishing, three-dimensional polishing uh, quality, um, where the surface of the side is kind of going in a very uh, compli complex shape, but you almost don't see it. It's really this kind of uh, needless uh, surface, and it just comes to life with the reflection of the polished material. So you can see the, the quality of the surface only in reality. It's really like the, how it comes to life. <clears throat> so, um, I'm now working here uh, two weeks ago. Uh, we had the first round of, uh, of a brainwash, let's say. I'm very happy to, to be part of the school and to, to use my, my ideas and my energies together with the students and the, and the school. And as we were starting just um, last week, now this week actually, on Monday, I asked the students to, to uh, present a range of pictures that mattered to them. So it, it's an inspiration uh, collection of things that are close to, each other, uh, to, to the students, that they like, that inspire them, that touch them, maybe memories from the childhood. And we really try to get into um, who we are and why we're doing what we're doing, why we're doing design, what's what drives us. And as you might uh, experience through my, um, through my presentation, um, there is something that interests me, and therefore it's a reason for me to, to go deeper, to really explore it. And um, I, I'm, sh I'm absolutely certain that if you use your own interests, your own passions, the things that really matter to you for years, um, to, to be the basis of your work, then your work will be the most effective and, and most powerful. And um, the project uh, theme of our atelier is called Space Activated Emotion uh, in Corporate Scenography. So we're trying to use the quality um, that emotion can bring to our lives um, in our work and we use space to activate it. Space, intelligence, narrative, storytelling. We push it into uh, the extremes of what's possible, and we try to do that under the, the hood of a brand, of someone who gives us reason to do it. The brand could be ourselves, the brand could be, you know, uh, something imagined, but we'll try to do it with a, with a proper company. 
Um, so I was showing the inspiration of the students. I now uh, want to show one of the projects that inspired me personally very much. It was exhibited at the Documenta in Kassel a couple of years ago by uh, this artist. And he had this space where he had a projector um, hitting a very strong white uh, circle of light on the wall. And what you almost can't see inside, because it's so bright, there was a, uh, a frame in there, a, fra a picture frame. But you, you couldn't see anything, it was too bright. And you had to, like these people do, kind of step into the, into the scene, step onto the stage, and, and kind of been seen by all the people in the room that you are now in the middle of the light and you had to approach it and stand just in front of it. So you could see what was written on this uh, frame. So it was projected from the back with light and the strength of the light from the front made it disappear. But if you push your shadow on it, you could read the text. And it says something like, you came here to read the word art in your own shadow. Um, so you can argue if you like this project or not, but for me what was really, really touching in this exhibition was um, the effect on people visiting it. So I was sitting maybe for two hours on the floor in a corner of the space just observing people coming in like looking, what's that? You see other people, you go, you don't want to get into the light, but you do eventually. And, and then like the surprise of finding out how all that worked by yourself, just you could sense the sensation of everybody getting in there. And this was something that I felt, I, this is what I want to do with my work. This is what really, uh, can drive uh, what I'm doing. Um, you talked about this key moment, yeah. the installation from Gonzalo Diaz. We see a rich variety of different projects. Is there something like a red wire which inspires you like in your daily work? Is there something where, which you always come back to and say, that motivates me or it gives me like a certain way of iteratively like uh, advancing projects? Well, in general, I think with most creative people is, is uh, wanting to do something that matters. It doesn't really mean, you know, in a certain way, but to matter in general. It can matter for just one person, it can matter for a big audience, but the, the things I do, I want them to have an impact, a reason to be existing. That, to be honest, that's enough in general. It's hard to get there, to have things matter, because we live in a world where we're just bombarded by things and ideas and Instagram and YouTube and I don't know and exhibitions and there is giants walking through the city um, So how can I as a creative person do something that that has a meaning that has an impact that has a sustainable uh, Part of someone's life. That's maybe the m the main motivation and as for the inspiration um it really comes to your own experiences. So it, if you have seen something like this and you can kind of use that memory to push it into your own work, that will be the strongest uh, impact possible other than just seeing nice projects after nice projects and trying to copy it or try to understand how that works. The, the own emotions that you had, their own experiences, they're the most valuable inspiration source I find, other than everything else, obviously. Great art, great food, great music. I mean, you can have a list like this, but it's really 
the things that you have felt yourself that give uh, source to to find solutions. One more question. You were talking about a very important phase, the, the transition when you left like Studio Hannes Wettstein. And we all know as a young person it's always difficult like to start something new. Mm. Um, how do we imagine like you left the office and then how did you get in contact with the first clients? Did they approach you or you went out? What can you give like as an advice also like to young designers who start like their collective, uh, their own office? What is like, also, like let's say like the, the essential quality they need to have to, to be brave enough to start their own uh, business? Well, if you decide to do uh, your own business, um, you just have to expect to, to work a lot, because will, nothing will come for free. You, you really have to work your, <laughs> your ass off. Um, but um, if that's the urge that you want to be independent, that you want your own uh, yeah, uh, the things that matter to you to, to surround you, um, then you will find this energy to do it. And there is no uh, shortcut or no trick to get to success. It's really about hard work. And it's about um, being dissatisfied. This is something very interesting. Another quote I found that um, quality of design doesn't come from the love for the client. It comes from your own dissatisfaction. So this is what's driving the quality, not that you think, oh, this is such a nice brand. I have to do something fantastic. You define when it's good enough. So you have to push yourself and be unhappy until it's really good. And um, if this uh, is the basis of your work, then you'll, you'll meet success at some point. And giving guidance about how to approach the audience is very, very individual. Some uh, might have to invite everybody they know, Others will just call up companies and ask them directly. It's, I don't think there is a kind of like a, a general thing I could say, but anyhow, you have to um, be not just creative in your work, but also creative in the way to approach um, your audience. Uh, and you can learn from everything surrounding us. You can learn from how artists do it. You can learn how you know, mus musicians do it, and as I was showing with the Kickstarter project, there is new ways of doing it that were just not existing before, and you can really use them for yourself. You just have to see where your capabilities can have an impact. So, because everybody pushes all the triggers and sends their images on Instagram, and I don't know, so you have to find a w an outlet to your work that works with what you do um, and to be unique enough to be seen and, and, and heard. That's basically it. No. Thanks a lot. Do we have questions from the public? I have one more project that I could show if uh, time allows. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> because the impact that I um, that I showed with this uh, with this installation that I've that I've experienced myself, um, and this quote that I said before, um, I used obviously used or tried to use for my own work, and one of the projects where this happened to work very well was an installation I did in London during my uh, time at the Royal College of Art. It was uh, part of my final degree show, and I did an installation in Kensington Gardens, which is part of the Hyde Park, just next to the college, where um, 
yeah, all the, uh, the nice buildings are. And um, I installed this uh, time machine or like a sundial uh, installation in the grass. And it consisted of uh, various aluminium uh, sheet metal elements that were just placed um, in, a, in a weird uh, organization. And when you walked through the, through the park, kind of trying to find the reason for this, you would find a spot where suddenly all these elements kind of lined up to form numbers. And you would just you know, try to find that position where you could see all the numbers at the same time. And when you did find this position, and there was only one exact spot in the grass, yeah. Um, then all those numbers would line up um, and form this uh, re arrangement of numbers. And what then happened, because you're standing here, this is the sweet spot where you can see all of the numbers in the precise way. Now um, you are the center of the clock, and now your own body's shadow will show the time. So you are the sundial yourself. Um, and as you can see here, it's half past four or something like this uh, in this image I took. Um, so what was so uh, striking to me, oops, sorry, was just observing people as I did observe the work of Diaz with this project to just see how they would approach it, how they would just wander around and talk to each other, and then, ah, come here, I found it, and then be amazed by the moment of realizing that, that they now just became part of the installation. So this is something uh, absolutely uh, powerful to use uh, for your work, to include people into what the work is about. And I was sitting on that bench for hours again to kind of see what, how that worked and, and find the patterns. Um, so, oh, sorry, that was quick. So I constructed um, the, uh, the installation on the computer to, to define the right uh, shapes for all uh, numbers. So this is done in alias to, you know, to see how they had to look like. And then I built them myself uh, from, from aluminum sheets. Let's see. This is a little video I did. Um, obviously, the quality of my camera didn't match with what all your mobile phones are able to shoot today. But this is 2007. Um, but you can sense the, the way it was uh, set up. Um, I was a bit unfortunate uh, for the fact that during my time of the installation, which, which was two and a half weeks, it was almost raining every day. It was the rainiest month in London for 50 years. I'm not kidding. Um, so at that day, I was taking the video just after six o'clock. The sun came out and I was rushing with my camera. But anyhow, the impact was there and, and it was a, a project for me that really uh, made a, a big step in, in, in my work. Um, I was wrong with the last project. There is uh, one more. Um, out of this interest for like this visual trick and this kind of anamorphose effect, um, I did another installation in Shanghai where I was living for almost a year before I moved back to Switzerland. And I was asked by a friend who uh, just had acquired a building that they would reconstruct um, as a new office building. And um, he gave me a kind of carte blanche to do an installation in there before they would go into um, the, the setup of the new spaces. And um, I was doing it during the Chinese New Year holidays where 
almost everybody kind of goes to where their families are. So there is still people around, but the workers are not on the site anymore, and it's just really a special time for everybody. Um, and he wanted the building not just to be dead. He didn't want it, uh, the building to be dark in that neighborhood where you know there was fireworks and celebrations. So um, I came up with an installation. Um, obviously not much budget, but I was given maximum creative freedom. Um, what I did, I, I glue uh, rice paper on the back of the windows and I bought um, fish tanks, 12 of them, and built this little wooden structure underneath. There is a light source in there, and there is a mirror inside the water. And obviously there is a little fish in there, swimming around, uh, having a good time. And um, what you can see is a projection or a shadow of this little fish on the rice paper. So you can see that outside. But I was more interested in what else could happen than just a projection. So what I figured out is if I place the mirror as I do here, there is two different shadows of the fish. One is the light that comes from above, hitting the fish, hitting the mirror. And then there is the light hitting the mirror first, then the fish, then coming out. And the effect is that you see those two parallel um, shadows of the side view and of the ground view of the fish. And this gives a really poetic, simple dance of those two uh, directions of the animal. And you kind of wonder, is it two fish in there? Or why they're so super parallel? And it's purely analog. There is no you know, projector, no computer, nothing. It just really works with simple elements, very analog. And because I had to place these uh, bubble uh, thingies in there for the, for the air to come into the water, um, they were also um, casting shadow. So from the outside, it, it looked like the whole building was kind of underwater because of the bubbles and then all these fish swimming inside. So this is now the view from the outside before everything you've seen was inside. So people would just pass the street and just stand there and just watch the weird scenery. It was uh, very lovely to see how the, the neighborhood was getting involved. It was kind of talk of, not talk of the town, but talk of the neighborhood. And people would come and see it and ask how it would work. They would try to get in and see where the big fish are. They wanted to see the big fish. So that was uh, a nice thing that I was able to work on. So. Let's see if this works one more time. Um, so as I'm now starting to work here at the school, I, can't, I, I had the urge to kind of express also the reason why working with students, working within the, the field of teaching is interesting for me. And um, I had a very uh, touching experience about six years ago when I did a, uh, um, a one-week uh, program called Naikan. It's a Japanese ritual where you sit into um, a tiny room and you meditate and you think of your connections to uh, people that are close to you. It's something Buddhists uh, established at uh, a certain time, and it's now done all over the world. And uh, a friend of me recommended, go there, do it. And uh, not knowing what would happen, I just sat in there for seven days. And you have a coach that comes in every hour, and you can talk to him, and then you're on your own again. And you go through three very simple um, 
questions or three things that you think about. Um, you're thinking about um, what you've received from the, pers from the people that are close to you. You start with your parents, you start with your mother, and then you go by certain times of your life through all the, your siblings, your grandparents, and you really kind of get an understanding of um, what they gave you, um, what you might have given to them, and then finally um, the harm you may be caused for someone else. Very simple things, and you just, I mean, what did I harm my father when I was two years old? I don't know. But I can imagine, I can go through this, you know, idea of, you know, going back in time. And as it is unbelievably personal, it also means that it kind of brings back your whole kind of life story in a, in a way. And you're sitting in this tiny room every day and no mobile phone, nothing. It's just, this itself is an unbelievable experience. But what happened to me um, as I did this ritual and as I did my little notes, I had my sketchbook with me and this is just one of the pages I filled during that time. Um, was that I became so unbelievably thankful for uh, what I had received. It was a feeling I, I could barely take, this thankfulness for my parents and for so many pe people that had given me and given me and given me for all my life up until that moment. And what happened is I really had this urge of wanting to give back. This was the most dominant feeling that I took away from this chamber when I left, that I wanted to give back in whatever way, which I now do um, to my own children. I'm fortunate enough to have two of them that I can give back, and I'm also very happy to give back in the school for the time to come. Thanks to you, Simon. Thanks for giving us a great lecture. I don't think you will do any harm to the <laughs> school, just in the contrary. If nobody has a question, I propose that you take a short uh, break, a short refreshing, and join us again at one o'clock. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thank you.